Let's pray. Lord, what sweet words those are. And more importantly, what a sweet truth it is to know that you are our foundation, that you won't be shaken, and that we can fully trust in you. Lord, help us not to forget that. Help us to remember that you are unchanging and you are our resting place, Lord. As we come to this time where we remember your death on the cross, God, help us to grow in our love for you, Lord, and help us just be in awe in what you did when you went to the cross, Lord, in your name. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Grace Bible Church. We're at the part of our service where we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And this morning, we're going to um, look at a passage in the book of John. So if you have a Bible, please turn there with me. And if you don't have a Bible, uh, there are men in the front that would love to put one in your hands. Just raise your hand and they'll hand it out. We're going to look at John chapter 1. We're going to start reading in verse 29. But before we do, I want to set the stage a little bit. In this passage, Jewish leaders from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to question John the Baptist about his identity. They ask him if he's the Messiah, if he's Elijah, or if he's the prophet. And John denies being any of these. Instead, he identifies himself as the voice of the one calling in the wilderness, fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy by preparing the way for the Lord. When questioned about his authority to baptize, John emphasizes his role as a humble forerunner, stating that someone much greater than he is coming, whose sandals he is not worthy to untie. Now let's pick it up in verse 29. On the next day, he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Once again, I'm struck by a verse that we all know well. And yet in my study this week, I wanted to turn over every word. And as I do this morning, I want you guys to have a fuller picture of who Jesus is. Jesus told the disciples when he laid out the sacrament of communion to remember him, and today I want to remember this Lamb of God. These words in this verse are familiar to us, but they were stunning when spoken. Imagine the scene as Jesus approached the area of Bethany and John spotted him in the distance. While he was busy with his work, John the Baptist looks up and sees Jesus coming. The Greek word for saw indicates a momentary glance And that's all he needed for his impression to register. And while Jesus is still way off, John the Baptist was likely the first to see him. He stops whatever he was doing and impulsively draws everyone's attention to Jesus. And then the commanding, behold, riveting all eyes upon him, opening all ears for what he was going to say. When was the last time something like that happened to you? Where you saw something no one else saw and you wanted to catch everyone's attention. Wednesday of this week, we were at Sagebrush, and there were a few of us sitting there going through a book, and John McCoy said, hey, look, there's a coyote. And we all stopped and stared at this coyote walking down Warner Road. <laughs> this is, that was nothing compared to what John the Baptist said. They were riveted by this statement. Behold, the Lamb of God. Lamb of God is a familiar clause for us. We hear that all the time. The first biblical mention of lamb was in Genesis 22 when Abraham went to the altar to offer his son. Leviticus 14 talks about lambs as a guilt offering. But to this audience, lamb of God was a striking statement. A commentator describes the phrase by saying, it combines in one descriptive term the concepts of innocence, voluntary sacrifice, substitutionary atonement, effective obedience, and redemptive power. John says that Jesus is the lamb, not just a lamb of God. He is the lamb par excellence. And he is God's lamb. That is the lamb especially provided by God for the sin of the world. The lamb which belongs to God, his lamb which he ordained as a sacrifice for himself. The lamb whose blood is to be shed. And because because of this, it relays to the hearer the idea of being without blemish. 
John declares Jesus as being sinless and joined with this divine purpose and aim of substitution, expi expiation, and redemption. A truer, more expressive title could not be given to Jesus himself. The Savior was the Lamb of God. And what kind of lamb was Jesus? He was the takes away the sin kind of lamb. The Greek verb for take away has the sense of bearing off, getting rid of, or carrying away, which suggests the idea of sins being wiped away. Takes away is a present tense with a future focus, and sin is in the singular, referring to the totality of the world's sin rather than a number of individual acts. According to the pattern set by the Old Testament sacrificial system, the shed blood of the substitute covered the sins of others and appeased the divine wrath by way of atonement. And Hebrews makes it clear the entire Old Testament sacrificial system was merely a provisional until the coming of Christ. Jesus takes upon himself the sin, not merely of Israel, but of the entire world. The thing to be taken away is named the sin of the world, the world of men. This is one of those great collective singulars, so easily pronounced by our lips without proper, commen, com, he he, without proper comprehension by our minds. Like most of the terms for sin, this term is negative, missing the mark, missing it by thought, word, or deed. By our very, com, by our very condition, it is corrupt by nature. For a second, Think of the deadly damning power of a single sin. Then multiply this power by a million. And then again by another million. You can't, can you? I quickly get to a number in size and punishment that is beyond my ability to comprehend. However, push your thoughts for the furthest you can think of, and at that point, you will begin to measure the stain and size of sin. And at that point, you start to see the lamb. But don't stop there. Sin and being guilty go hand in hand. Sin cannot exist apart from its power to make one guilty. And you cannot be guilty without consequences. So consequences stick to the sin, closer than a shadow. Neither the guilt nor the consequences are taken away, really taken away, unless the sin itself is taken away. So the Lamb of God will take away the sin, the guilt, and the consequences for every single person that puts their faith in God. Martin Luther said it so well. He said, sin has but two places. Either it's with you, or it lies, and it lies upon your neck, or it lies upon the Christ, the Lamb of God. If it lies upon the neck, you are lost. If, however, it lies upon Christ, you are free and will be saved. Take now whichever you prefer. If you're here today and by your own admission you are not a Christian, I'm so glad you're here and hearing the message today. But the burden, guilt, and consequences for your sin are on your neck today. Please see one of the elders, the person that brought you, or anyone here, and ask them what it means to remove that burden and live for Christ. And I'd like to ask you to let the elements pass, as this is a time set aside for those that put their trust in Christ to remember him. Christian, you're going to be taking communion on your own this morning. And in a second, men will bring a cup and a piece of cracker. And the cracker will help you remember Christ's body, and the cup will help you remember his blood. Remember that Lamb of God who went to the cross to take away your sins. And take communion on your own this morning. Men, please serve us.